How you doing today, Brian? Good. How about you, Nick? Not doing too bad. You know, the weather's weather's good and stuff's looking up for you in Colorado, right? Starting to clear up. Uh, you know, other than you guys being 100 degrees and then snowing the next day. But You know, we uh, set we set a new record with the, the fastest transition in temperatures that we've recorded going from over 100 to below freezing in three days. Well, that's that's mountain weather for you, right? Wait 15 minutes, it'll be different, right? Kind, kind of is, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a record that any of us wanted to set, though. <laughs> hey, but at least at least you know for you guys the snow probably cleared you know quite a bit of stuff up. But, for sure, so, yeah. <laughs> today we had uh, Jason Pierce on the show, and uh, it, w- it was some good conversation. It was, yeah. He's a really interesting guy. He's had a lot of different pursuits. He's been involved in uh, in years past in sort of one of the big name design firms uh, in Denver. Uh, he has gone on to forge a path with data science, and that's really what his current entrepreneurial practice is all built around. But, you know, he interconnects it with all different forms of marketing and, uh, you know, has a lot to say about sort of the importance of data quality, uh, sources of data, curation of data, you know, ultimately, what are all the varieties of areas of practice you need to be prepared for to undertake that kind of journey, but also how it can be done in, in smaller chunks, right, with more of an iterative approach. Yeah, and I liked our, our conversation because we, we kind of talked more marketing probably than anything, right? It's It's been a bit different than than data guests we've had in the past, but as some of these tools have come along, like the HubSpots and MailChimp and, you know, all these other things are kind of, some people think they're gray area because they track too much of what people do, mm. but you know, the data is coming in and what, what do you do with it? Right. It's like, it's like having a garage, right? The bigger garage you have, the more <laughs> junk you tend to put in it without looking in there, deciding if you want to keep it. So we even talked about, you know, do you collect data and then what do you do with it? Um, so, so it was kind of, all over the place and it was a good conversation, you know, a different along the lines in the conversations we've had with, with data analyst and data scientist in the past. And punctuated with a little bit of entrepreneurship chat in there as well. So there's, there there's go. something for everybody, I think in this episode. And with that, I think let's just uh, let the listeners get on with the show. Here we go. All right. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Lead.exe. I'm Brian Comerford in Denver, Colorado. And I'm Nick Lozano, Washington, D.C. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Jason Pierce, who is a data scientist and founder of Marketing Science Department. Jason, thanks for coming along for the ride with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. And we're super excited to have you with us. So uh, interested in in talking about a lot of things today, uh, picking your brain on uh, the importance of data, on some of your own experiences as an entrepreneur, challenges that you may have faced uh, doing startup, which is, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a bold path for anyone to take. And and, uh, I know that you've got a lot of stories uh, that you can share with that along the way. One of the things that I, I love about your website is just right there, big and bold. Um, you know, the first thing that you see on the splash page is data tells stories. Are you listening? And, you know, as I've been thinking just in terms of where we could start the conversation today, I wanted to ask you, you know, data is something that uh, I think across every industry type we've heard you know, the importance of it, but there's still a lot of business leaders out there. You know, they may understand how their business operates. They may understand the importance of sort of all the underlying mechanics of their business. They may not be data literate necessarily. And so for those types of business leaders, how do they even uh, develop the acumen to start listening to some of those stories that their data is telling them? Yeah, I think, um, the, the key place to start for people is to ask questions. You know, most of us and especially leaders in, in different businesses are going to get reports. They're going to have all this data presented to them. And it's really important that you dig in and ask questions and try and understand like, what's going on. Ask that question. Why? Why is this metric changing? Why is it important to the outcomes maybe that we have set through OKRs or KPIs or, um, you know, those different measures of success we might have? Uh, but to start drilling in and understanding the why component, because that is what really defines the stories. Now you said something interesting there about reports. 
And, you know, to me, uh, I think that's probably the orientation port point for a lot of, uh, you know, business types, which is, you know, I get this thing, it tells me something about what happened. Uh, and then, you know, based on that, uh, I can make some kind of decision or I can start asking some of those questions. Um, but, you know, given all that has evolved uh, in the world of data and the world of technology and, and the convergence of all these tools that are driving us more and more towards these predictive things. Um, doesn't that kind of feel like it falls flat at this point for what the orientation people might have with their data? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um, just to get reports is not actually beneficial, right? We, we get these things like dashboards in our emails and reports and people send us things and it just becomes overwhelming and it's not, useful. And, and most of the clients that I work with, they get so much, but it's not actually being used and it's not actually being leveraged. Um, so I, yeah, I think, and especially as you get into more, um, like you talked about uh, predictive tools and things to tell you when like something, well, there's a meaningful change and that can help level up your awareness to say, Hey, something's really important change, that's changing here. You need to go pay attention to it and ask those deeper questions and really dig into what that is because it, you know, we have so much data that it's just not, not helpful to see another trend chart or another, you know, another pie chart, God forbid. Um, it's just not, not going to be that beneficial. Hey, we can do a donut chart. It's okay. <laughs> <Three> <laughs> <feet> only. <laughs> so Jason, I think that's a good point to just uh, back in and ask you to do a quick uh, intro of yourself, quick bio, if you could. Sure. Um, so I got started, um, my mom worked for IBM when I was little. And so I had one of the first like PCs that came out. Um, we talked about Windows 3.1 earlier. I had one <laughs> of the first ones that, that was available and uh, you know, started doing a lot with that when I was a kid. I ran a, a, a BBS across my little you know, modem when that first became available and that really <laughs> sparked my interest um, you know, around how technology helps people communicate and, you know, I, I, and I kept that interest going. And once I got into college, I started working on, um, on marketing. I studied design. Um, I started doing web design. And then through that, like web development, and started bringing in the coding side again. Um, I got my career start in advertising, um, not on the design side, but doing like account management and kind of understanding how brands were connecting with consumers and how we could use different media to, to drive those relationships, especially uh, digital. I worked with uh, some agencies here in Denver um, and we helped to kind of launch online media as capabilities for these agencies. Um, I went back to grad school and got an MBA in e-commerce and a master of science in data warehousing so that we could better understand and leverage the ability that, you know, that data was bringing because we were just starting you know, really see the explosion of web and see digital, not only on your website, but through all these different tools. And that's really proliferated, like as you see social media. Um, you know, from there, I started working more with marketing departments and advertising agencies. Um, I think now I've worked with 160 different clients, um, primarily all in the, in the marketing and advertising space. Um, and a lot of what we focus on um, through company marketing science is about helping clients um, make use of their data and understand understand it, be able to tell those stories. Also being able to collect the right data and be able to leverage it through, um, through different marketing campaigns. Like we're active on Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and uh, Google ads and all the places where digital property needs to be these days um, and helping to develop those, those conduits so that customers can, can better interact with brands and we can understand what's going on and, and optimize as we go. Are you able to share what some of those more exciting campaigns have looked like? You know, can you, can you name a client or a, a client type uh, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, a challenge that you were faced with that, uh, that kind of helps surface a lot of those things that you describe that you do? Um, you know, our, our, my favorite ones to work with are small businesses, actually. Um, you know, the enterprise guys are, are fun, too. I don't want to take anything away from them. Uh, <laughs> But the small businesses, especially now, you know, in, our, in the current environment, it's, it's difficult. Um, and for a, lot of, for a lot of our, we've lost some small business clients, unfortunately, who have, who have not been able to survive. Um, but for some of the others, 
um, it's it's very it's personal, and there's a lot of opportunity to really help to help these guys and to help them not only survive but to grow and to build new audiences as consumer behaviors are changing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, more people are going online not just for not just for retail, which is you know definitely a huge trend right now. Um, but to uh, but to interact more through through social media, uh, to do more classes, to do more events online, and so that's been a big uh, it's been a big change. So um, we have a couple clients who do uh, varieties of training, so music lessons, cooking schools, and you know they've had this dynamic shift between I can't do anything in person, so we're going to go online and we're going to figure that out, and how do we communicate that? to users so that people understand that this is, you know, that this is a good thing. You're still going to learn. You're still going to have great experiences. And then um, how do we gradually reintroduce? Now you have both modes and what's the right thing and, and having people um, understand the feeling of safety, but still being satisfied and getting out of the house and learning something. Um, we've been, we've been able to cycle over pretty fast and use lots of different channels, which, you know, that's about how you're using data in different places, right? We can understand demography from Google ads. And in these cases, we started with, um, with Google ads to begin with, with, uh, you know, you can define your keywords. So you understand that interest already, right? So we can leverage that. We take the demographic results from that piece and we can start to leverage that out and build new audiences and different social media platforms to kind of extend the reach of the campaign and help it and help it grow. And, uh, you know, that's been exciting for the quickness of it and exciting to see some great people, you know, grow their business through some challenging times. I like the way you brought that up. It's, it's almost like now, especially recently with current events that the IT leaders and the marketing leaders are working so much more closely together than they probably Mm -hmm. have in the past. Like you said, you know, in-person events are kind of a no-go in most jurisdictions still. So people are trying to figure out how do we do those online? How do we drive engagement? How do we uh, figure out that challenge? Um, so what, what is one of the biggest challenges you've, you've seen as people are trying to make this transition from physical products to, to digital products um, from a data perspective? Um, yeah, it's the balance between trying to define what it is really quickly and Mm -hmm. then getting your data collection set up really quickly. Um, In in terms of um, we talk about, you know, collecting data, leveraging data, right? It starts with collecting it. And that's honestly in marketing technology, that's the hardest part is Mm -hmm. getting the right data in because if Mm -hmm. you have garbage data, you tell an inaccurate story Mm -hmm. and you, you, you know, so you have nothing to really leverage at that point. Um, so, but setting that up really quickly or extending what you're already doing can be very difficult, especially when you're, you're talking about a business that's 100% focused on in-person mm-hmm. and then saying, we're going to extend that. Well, you know, you're grabbing different technology vendors, different partners to stitch together an experience and going, well, how are we going to measure this and trying to do those pieces quickly so that you're not just doing it, but so that you're putting together an experience that's in line with your brand and in line with the consumer's expectations and something to help them um, have a good experience and, and enrich their lives at a, a difficult time. Yeah, you know, and there's, a, I think, a tendency for a lot of folks to be enamored with data visualizations and what those things can offer. But part of what I just heard you say in terms of just the lion's share of the work coming from the data collection and making sure that you've got quality data Mm -hmm. beginning with the end in mind, so to speak, so that, you know, if you're driving towards certain outputs, there's going to have to be certain inputs that are of a certain quality and standard. That's, you know, that tends to be the boring soldiering work that no one's ever excited to hear is going to be incumbent on their business. What what do you mean, Brian, if we just don't get the data, we have all the visualizations we need? That's right. Yeah, you can click on all sorts of stuff and drill down into it. It just doesn't mean anything. (laughs) Right. So, So walk us through how you help to educate some of your clients around that importance of 
of data quality or even how do you start breaking things down? So, you know, someone wants to shoot the moon and you try to narrow cast things a little bit so that you can have, you know, more of a maturity curve that you help, you know, take people along that development life cycle. Right. Um, you know, we typically start with um, having people understand their goals. Like when you see a report, what is it you need to, you need to see? What are the key things that are important for your business? And say, we're going to represent those visually, but then what do we need to make those key things happen? And you can kind of back it out from there. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and we, we try to take, you know, like through, from a KPI standpoint, identify three of your top ones, only three, and start small with that. And then think about all the things you want to know. What are all the pieces to your business that can help define why, right? Is it number of visitors to your website? Well, maybe not. Maybe that's not important, right? Maybe it's conversions and how people buy, how much money they spend, how many products, or it's the repeat rate, or uh, where they come from, or other pieces of demographic information. That can be really important to layer in to talk about understanding that that why and getting down to telling the stories. Um, The reason we start with a small number is because of the reports that we talked about earlier, right? You don't need a lot of reports. You need to know a few key things and be able to understand the detail behind them. And Mm so we start with a few things and encourage people to really dig into those and then gradually expand. Um, We like people to start with a core piece. So usually it's their website. Not all businesses have website as their their kind of center, Um, especially with the expansion of social media. That's definitely not the case as much as it used to be. Um, but start with that. It's just the easiest thing to measure because you own it. You should own it. Mm-hmm. If you don't, it's a different set of problems. <laughs> um, but start with that and then understand how people are interacting with it. And we can sort of make a list of here are the pieces we need to add to that. And then go and gradually start adding. Um, I think that it's often um, what people and clients a lot of times want to do is we're just going to go do it all at once. We're just going to add everything, all the things we need to know. And that's kind of problematic because you don't know the questions you're going to be asked tomorrow, right? And it's best to kind of prepare. And and everything that you want to collect has a cost. Data collection is not free. I don't care what people say. Google Analytics is free or whatever. These, you know, Google Stack is free. It's not. Um, there's always the cost of maintenance and you have to keep an eye on it. And um, collecting the wrong thing can actually get you into trouble. Uh, you know, think of GDPR and, you know, the Colorado Consumer right. Privacy Protection Act mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and COPA for children. Like there's lots of legality and, and lots of risk in collecting the wrong information. So um, you need to, to sort of plan that out. It's better to go a little bit at a time and, and keep incrementing and keep growing out the data that you're collecting and that you're making decisions on so that you build confidence as you go. Then you know, you start from your website, add in your apps, or what's the next most important way that consumers and your customers are interacting with you. And maybe it's your social media channels. Okay, go get that data. Maybe it's your email. Gradually keep going and adding into those. If you're a B2B company, it might be Salesforce. It might be a different tool that uh, that your, your sales teams are using. You can add that in to better understand. Um, as you start to go through that process, it'll become more and more evident about what the next piece is that you need. Mm -hmm. And usually as you're going through your KPIs going, why did this change? What did that change? The next layer of questions, because questions and answers create new questions, that will sort of drive what you're gonna do. It helps to drive that focus and and where you spend your time next. That's great. I I heard you mention Salesforce in there. And so (laughs) I, I hear this a lot from a variety of different companies. There, you know, one of the challenges that I tend to come across today is that a lot of companies have been set up with very fractured systems so that, you know, sales kind of lives over in one place and they've got their own set of systems. And then there's the servicing that lives over in another, another place and they've got their own set of systems. And then there's accounting and finance and they're kind of over here in their own systems. <laughs> and, and so there's, there's a, a breakage of the continuity and, mm-hmm. and some of the strength around something that's more platform based like Salesforce is that now you've got sort of the, the CRM component 
as that, you know, bench strength component that's in the center of how the technology works, but because of the platform nature of it, now it's easy to have all of those integration points directly into it or grab things that third-party creators in the app exchange have put together for you to, to help start rounding out, you know, having more of a comprehensive suite versus mm-hmm. all of these little fractured you know systems with a variety of vendors and, and players so how often is that a challenge as you're kind of coming into the the starting point with your interaction with clients <laughs> almost every time and that <laughs> that same problem exists not just with salesforce but with almost every set of tools i mean i think mm-hmm. in the marketing technology world there are it's well over 5000 now i want to say over 6000 different tools in that environment and all of them define your customers differently. Um, if you can center around something like Salesforce and say, like, this is the, the center, this is the sun to our solar, our <laughs> marketing or data solar system, then that is a, a big decision point and a, a place to start from, right? And while Salesforce does provide lots of opportunities to integrate, and if you can use other, if some of your other marketing tools, Combined with Salesforce to do that, then great. It will make it easier. Many of your tools will not do that automatically. Um, if you're planning for something more consumer side, um, yeah, there's a different set of challenges. And it's part of that maturity curve to say, who is going to define what a customer is for us? Because in the end, all these different approaches are about people um, because people buy things. People are going to interact with you. And you, it, the, the goal is then to understand how people interact with you across different touch points and different systems. And so if you want to understand and identify a person who is doing things with you, then you need to have some common way of doing that across systems and lots of different tools have their own approaches and they're all, you know, they all have their pros and cons. Um, I think it's, it, it's uh, something we always run into and it's something that can be, complicated and have its own set of solutions sort of depending on what your center is and how your approach is going to be. Um, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, maybe you can build your own and then start passing your own customer IDs into different tools to sort of drive what that solution is. Um, that's not always the case. Um, but it, it does get to, when you get to that level, I think, you know, you need to make sure that analytics and that your data collection process is important and has sort of a seat at the table in your enterprise. Um, you know, that data governance is important and that you have some direction on how that's going to be managed, how it's going to be thought of, because if not everybody is aligned on here, are the way, here's the way we're going to identify our customers and our prospects, then you will run into challenges because different, different organizations, different groups, within your company are going to have their own tools and they're going to want to do their own thing. And if they're not speaking that common language of who is your customer, you will start to have gaps and, you know, lose the progress that you're making. I think you brought up all valid points there. And one of the things I I know my experience is as a technologist is when you start talking about data analytics, everyone's like, Oh, we'll just send it to go do that and they'll figure it out. Right. But when really, it should be a team of people comprised of people from different silos, right? Because mm-hmm. IT has a different perspective as a customer, as accounting does, as sales Absolutely. does, as B2B does, as B2C does. Um, so so how important it is, how important is it to get the other team members and different silos of business involved in this customer journey, figuring out who the customer is? Yeah, I mean, just you may bring up a great point. It's, it's really critical to have everybody um, talking about it. Uh, I I think um, the way to get there is if you're a leader of your organization and you're engaging with the data and you're talking about it, you will get everyone else talking about it. Trying to prove the ROI of analytics can be difficult. Um, A lot of times it's a cost center and not always you know, the, the way to get new revenue is the ideas. We're used to that the, as IT guys. Right? Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's certainly avenues to, to show that your data creates revenue. A-B testing is a great way to do that um, because you can attach specific lifts in your revenue to a different way to treat customers. But um, I think um, it comes back to 
uh, having people understand, having everyone understand that it's important and they all need to come to some agreement. And, and the reality is that all the people involved from IT and marketing or accounting and sales, they all have a really important role to play. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't have to be this overwhelming process, um, but I think everyone needs to be involved and different groups are going to take different leadership roles with the different tools. Yeah, no one ever really wants to have the responsibility. They want to be the one that's sitting in the seat that says, deliver me the ROI calculation. Right. <laughs> deliver me the visualizations, right? I just want yeah. the dashboards. That's right. That's right. I, I want to be able to take credit for having steered the project, not yeah. having to have participated in all this stuff that sounds really painful. <laughs> Since we're talking about visualizations and dashboarding and analytics, how much of it is just educating people on how to read charts? Um, and, and different things like that, just, just basic, you know, like math, right. Statistics, how these yeah. things work is, is some of the edgy end user education, just basic statistics and modeling, um, it, it's some education along that lines. I absolutely. I mean, I think that in every company, you're going to have a group of power users, like knowledgeable analysts, mm -hmm. depending on your company that maybe, you know, one or two and maybe dozens. Um, but I think those are really your kind of, um, you know, those are the missionaries of your data. And <laughs> it's kind of their, <laughs> their responsibility and their opportunity um, to do some education. And mm -hmm. as these reports or as you, know, you start to share out visualizations and tell the stories, you know, your stories are the verbal or written component to the charts and to the data that underlies it. Right. And if, uh, you know, they, there's that opportunity to educate not only with stats because stats maybe may not apply to everything, but if you're looking at mm -hmm. a simple trend chart to say, well, here's what this really means. Here's how to read the scale value. Mm -hmm. One of the worst things you can do is like, you know, drop off some charts and be like, you know, awesome. Uh, good luck with that and hope for the best. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's a, a, an important piece to, to help drive success long-term. Well, and of course, it's it's one of those things that, you know, needs to factor into the value consideration, right? I mean, right. if you're just dropping off a finished product and no one understands how to use it, how valuable is that? You know, right. what, what happens to your ROI at that point? Right. I mean, you're back to reports being sent to your email that no one reads. <laughs> no one ever looks at. I mean, the classic story. But they look and, good. Yeah. The, the classic thing in, in analytics, um, I've worked on a lot of Adobe analytics implementations, right? These are so it's pretty, probably, you know, mostly bigger companies um, where you have thousands of users all getting reports and you can't tell uh, who is receiving them and if they're being used. And so lots of times we would just turn them off. <laughs> to see if anyone complains, right? Like, yeah. well, this data is not valid anymore because we made a change in the variables or whatever. And we don't know who's reading them or who's receiving them. So we're just going to turn it off and see who screams and then we'll go try and fix it. And if no one says anything, then we don't have to worry about it anymore. And that was like almost always no one said anything. We were talking about email information. It's the, the elevator conversations, the water cooler stuff that um, is often where some of the most meaningful things happen because you're just discussing what the results are. Yeah, the old scream test. It's funny how many stories there are for, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> particularly so for technologists. Right? <laughs> Turn this server off, see who complains. That's right. right? <laughs> we've, all, we've all got a few of those. The yeah. problem is you got to wait for a couple of months because someone might only hit that once a quarter, you know. Yeah, all of a sudden it's, it's like, true. hey, where's my, what's it? <laughs> that was running on an access database <laughs> oh, right. please don't say those words <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness yeah we probably all got some access database horror stories too mine was yeah. stepping into a company in 2004 and being told my first job was going to be to to refactor this thing no one knew what to do with it they just knew that it was it had outgrown itself itself and uh and it was desperately important that they had it functioning and when i found out that it was sitting in, a, in an access database on one person's computer it was being accessed by about 20 different users it was like ooh, wow well how about we just move this to an enterprise class database for starters 
<laughs> I I had uh, it's funny that uh, when I you, know, you talk to people who have enough history to have been you know doing things with access, it is like eighty percent of the time it existed on a computer under someone's desk or on somebody's <laughs> yeah. personal laptop. Like that was like it happened so often. Jason, you need to go convert this access database. Like where is it? Like oh, it sits in the closet over here. It's on like one computer, and hundreds right. of people are using it. Like, we haven't updated it for fear of breaking something. <laughs> <laughs> No matter what you do, there's like a sticky note on the cover. Don't turn this off. Right. <laughs> hey, that's at least better. At least they know where it is. Right. Get yeah, it. Nobody true. knows where it is. It's right. Like, Somebody yeah, leaves the company works. and their their computer gets wiped and then suddenly the utility's gone. Everyone's like, wait a minute, where is that thing? Oh, it was on Sally's computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, like like many things with Microsoft, you know, they designed things to be easy enough for people to have a lot of their own homegrown robust development out of it kind of you know exchange i think is similar in that it wasn't designed around file storage architecture but that's how people ended up using it so it eventually got mm -hmm. refactored to function in that way but uh, you know just as access has now been subsumed by things like power apps and you know uh, more of the o365 suite of, in the way of doing things but yeah. uh, it has made for some legacy challenges for those of us who have had to wrestle with <laughs> data and custom development over the years. Yeah. <laughs> so you said right now is a great opportunity for small organizations to kind of dig into uh, data analytics. So, so where would a small organization start, right? A smaller shop, maybe they have a website. Um, what, what type of things should, should they be looking at? Um. You know, I think the answer to that question is, um, like, what kind of business are they? Mm -hmm. um, the ones that we are, are working with right now, they are consumer focused. And so, you know, we start them off with, um, you know, wh where are you driving people? Is it to your website? Is it to Facebook? And let's start there. Where, where, mm -hmm. When you're talking to people, and you're having conversations, where are those conversations happening? Um, typically, it's the web. And so where we usually start for a small business is putting on Google Tag Manager and then Google Analytics. So mm -hmm. Tag Manager, um, the idea is instead of putting all your tracking code onto your website or into your app, you just you put the, tra the Tag Manager piece in and then your Tag Manager manages all the different tracking applications that you might want to add. So DoubleClick and Facebook and those tracking pixels and all this stuff that gets really fishy and big brotherish, you put it in there. Uh, it makes it really easy to control um, so that you can work on it separate from what your, your site or your app is doing. Um, and that gives you the sort of starting point and gets you into something like Google Analytics, which is a mm -hmm. great starting point for most businesses. Um, gives you a good understanding of you know, where are people coming to your site from social media or are they typing it in? Or are they, uh, you know, what are they doing? Are they submitting forms on your site? How long did they stay? Do they leave right away? Um, are they coming from, you know, search? If, they're, if it looks like they're coming from search, then you can add on Google Search Console. Um, mm. You just kind of take these, these gradual steps. Um, and I think it's important that small businesses to get involved with it, um, you start with like the three KPI thing. Start with a few things and work to understand those details about what it means to your business. Um, the, one of the great moments with a small business is when you start giving them some information and they were like, oh, yeah, we started running that, you know, that, that Facebook campaign and we, we did more posting because we saw that users were coming to our site from Facebook. So we, we did more, we boosted more posts and we added Facebook ads, right? And now we're getting more business. This is great. <laughs> the excitement and the fact that right. this is something that's making a positive change, like for me as, as a consultant, like I just, that's just the best thing ever um, to have that kind of interaction and to see them light up and just, you know, I think it's important if you're a small business to take advantage of that and to do what you can. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get started. Mm -hmm. um, you certainly can, um, but it may not be advantageous, but to learn a little bit about how people are finding you, it gives you the kind of like the levers. What are the levers and the dials? Next time business is not so good. What do I go do? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. How does it, it gives me some power as a business owner, right? Because now I can say, oh, I need, I need more pages. I need more content for SEO. And I need you know, to add some more campaigns uh, for, for Facebook or for Google ads, add some more keywords, right? You start to understand what are the pieces that are driving, 
driving business to you. And uh, it can be very empowering. What you just described there to me sounds a lot like how I see digital transformation. But yeah. digital transformation has become such this buzz term that I think it's interpreted to mean this wholesale change of everything rather than this iterative approach like you just des- described, right? Where you, you start small and, you know, whether you've done, you know, customer journey mapping or whatever, you, you understand kind of what all those touch points are in your client life cycle, right? right. And, and it doesn't have to be the full smack that gets updated to yeah. experience digital transformation. You just have to find those points where there's some weakness or there's some under optimization, mm-hmm. right? And, and then pivot in how you're doing something so that now it's actually caused improvement, right? Does that- yeah, I, I agree completely. I think a lot of, a lot of companies, especially as they start to get bigger, um, think that's like the big initiative to go down, right? I got to make everything digital. And, and yeah, they, there's some advantages to that. But I think just understanding, coming back to the basics, how do people, or how are people doing business with you? It's, this is about relationships, right? Mm-hmm. There's just new ways to do it. And mm-hmm. understanding the dynamics of those relationships. And if they need to be more digital, then you can move in that direction. But, you know, many times it's, it's not, but you want to have the additional channels and understanding that need, where it's being pulled. It's just a tremendous advantage. And, uh, yeah, the more buzzwords. I mean, I think that's <laughs> the digital transformation thing definitely has kind of run its course, I hope. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's something that, you know, it's got some sex appeal to it. And mm-hmm. it, it seems, you know, to those who are in the buyer's seat, it seems like something that we should probably have for our business if we're going to consider ourselves right. contemporary, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. whatever it is, go figure out, <laughs> spend some money on that, Mr. IT guy. It's funny because I was at a box. <laughs> I was at a conference a couple of years ago and somebody, you know, they had done like one of those live walls and said, digital transformation is, and somebody put a buzzword and somebody put, no, it's not. Then somebody put, yes, it is. And then no, it's not. And yes, it is <laughs> like, like 20 iterations of that. So like, <laughs> well, someone got it. <laughs> <laughs> Which one though? <laughs> <Ta-ding>. <laughs> well, let's shift gears a little bit, Jason. I'm, I'm interested in hearing some of your experience as an entrepreneur and as a leader, you know, you've, uh, you've, taken the tougher path or some would say the tougher path by uh, choosing to, you know, forge uh, your way as an independent businessman, uh, drumming up clients and, you know, having to market yourself and service and, you know, wear many hats, uh, you know, in your own company. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, why you chose to undertake that path in the first place and then some of the challenges that have helped shape your leadership perspective along the way. Oh, um, how I got started in it. Um, I think that, uh, because I got started in advertising, uh, my first uh, majority of my first like 10 years working on a one day myself, I guess, but the majority of that was in advertising where you're consulting all the time. Mm-hmm. And so you're, you're working in that mode a lot. And I just thought, uh, Hey, I'm a specialist. I can do all this, you know, online media stuff. I should, should branch out. It like, it seemed so, uh, so good and, and like the freedom and <laughs> do what you want, which is just total nonsense. Uh, <laughs> and then, but I, I do enjoy uh, being able to focus on things like it's just, I, I like development. I like data, I like the technology and I like to solve problems for people. Um, and I really enjoy this. Like some of the things we've talked about with helping businesses succeed, like that's super rewarding. I think, do a lot of the full-time jobs that I've had. You don't get that sort of level of, of good feeling at times with people. Um, so I, I enjoy those pieces. It's certainly a challenge um, as a consultant in this kind of web and digital space. The products are pretty short. Um, so, you know, managing that and keeping the flow coming in from a new business perspective, I think has probably been the biggest challenge that, that we've had over time. I think we've been in business uh yeah 10 years almost 11 um and congratulations so, thank you it's a i think a big hump um <laughs> but uh so yeah there's lots of challenges with it it's it's rewarding um you know lots of lots of times sometimes i uh yeah it, it's uh 
definitely a challenge. Um, not for everybody, for sure. Um, but uh, I know I've, I've been pretty happy with the decision and, and being able to to focus on it long term. And I'm excited for where things are going next. I mean, uh, you know, we're we're moving away, trying to move away from services as being our only thing and building automated platforms for marketing technology. So I can be like 6,501, I guess, uh, out of that big chart. But, um, <laughs> you know, there are lots of exciting things and it's, it's always um, fascinating to be able to write, you know, define your own strategy, your own objectives. Like, can you practice what you preach? Um, which is uh, always fascinating about uh, the differences between what I recommend to people and what I recommend to do myself. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's certainly a rewarding path. Well, you're the only one having that problem, by the way. <laughs> right? <laughs> I <knew> it. <laughs> so, you know, as you were embarking on this path of independence, you know, did you did you feel stepping into it day one that you felt equipped for understanding what was going to be needed to lead a business of this type? Uh, at the time I felt like I did and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You don't, you don't, I'm still learning. Like I've been, um, trying to get more involved with like the accounting side, um, mm -hmm. which I had not, that had not been my focus of so, like other people can do the accounting piece. And I've been, you know, developing to technical products and working on client service and, um, you know, but it's all important. And, um, I, I think that, you know, at the time when I started, you know, it was like, oh, I can just leverage these skills and just keep doing that. Um, but at some point you're, you want to grow and you want to be able to do more. And, and, and that's when I think it hit me like, oh, wow. I mean, this is way different than what they taught me in MBA school, you know, <laughs> and DU was great. Don't get me wrong, but um, it's a different thing. Being an entrepreneur is a, it's a different set of skills, I think. And mm -hmm. you, you, uh, I think you you kind of have to apply lots of different business ideas and principles in new and different ways. I mean, most entrepreneurs that I talk to, people who are running small companies, well, their experiences are not all the same. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, some of the problems you run into about like financing and new business and and growth and technology, those may be similar, but everyone's path is so unique. Um, and so it, maybe that's a piece that I really enjoy about it is there's never a sense of oh I've learned enough now. I'm a good mm. businessman, right? <laughs> You're always having to dig in and try something new. And um, I think that's an, an exciting part of it. Well, I know Nick and I have talked about this more than once, you know, business training, uh, like a lot of management training, it, it doesn't actually really set you up. I mean, it, getting an MBA, and you can correct me if you feel differently, it, it's not really the foundational work that's required to be an entrepreneur. Right. I completely agree. It's uh, I think it's good for preparing you for like a middle to low level manager kind of role. Um, mm -hmm. I think being good at, at, at being an entrepreneur, I don't want to say that I am good at it, um, but I think it's much more about your passion and, mm -hmm. you know, is it, is it something that you love to do? Like some, the, the people who I see are successful to me, that's the the one resonating piece is they just love it. They're not, they don't care about watch TV and I'm going to go, you know, mess around every day, play video games or whatever. Their business is what they really enjoy and what they really dig. And so that's where they spend their time. Like that is fun. And yeah. so that really drives it. And, and that's when you're going to put in the time that you need to sort these things out because it can be a mess sometimes to sort out. <laughs> I feel like being an entrepreneur, you, you have to be uh pretty happy with being a, you know, jack of all trades, kind of master of none, because sometimes you're the accountant, sometimes you're the janitor, right? You know, sometimes you're the sales guy. Um, you got to do it all. Yeah. And you have to act like you know what you're doing, which is <laughs> you know, half the time I'm like, yeah, I completely agree. That sounds like a great idea, you know, and just like, okay, we're just going to go with it now and see what happens. <laughs> Well, again, I think it's similar to the distinctions that Nick and I tend to place on management versus leadership, mm -hmm. right? Some people don't even realize that they're good leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and sometimes it's because they've never been in a management role. They don't supervise anybody. And so they right. don't even recognize their own uh, 
latent tendencies to rise into leadership behaviors in a variety of situations. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's a lot of leaders out there who aren't managers Mm -hmm. of varying Mm -hmm. companies, right? You just, because you have people reporting to you, doesn't make you a leader. Yeah. And, and you can be, uh, you know, an individual contributor in that role and still be a leader and still manage your manager and, and uh, do a lot of great work. Um, it, it's a different thing. Yeah, completely agree. It is. And it's, it's the type of thing I think that it requires, you know, part of what we were just talking about in terms of wearing many hats, uh, you know, being in an entrepreneurial role is not for the change averse you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> Similarly, being in a leadership role, uh, you know, it's not for someone who wants to micromanage others, right? It's for someone who wants to set direction and has a vision and knows how to create enthusiasm and can bring others along for the ride and be learning every day from their contributions and can enlarge their perspective and pivot when necessary. And, Absolutely. you know, so to me, the, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some kind of commonality uh, where there's a convergence between those two things, between leadership and entrepreneurship. And I'm just kind of curious if you, if you share that feeling. Um, I think a lot of the things, yeah, that make you successful, make you a good leader will also contribute to you being a good entrepreneur. Um, you know, to be a good entrepreneur, you also, I think, have to have some other things, good product development and but I think a lot of that's just going to result from maybe being a good leader and, and coming back to being a, a leader without managing people. If you're running a startup and you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, you're trying to build a new, uh, you know, a, a new lemonade, like you may be doing that yourself. Like you don't have a company. You're just, you're super passionate about this and you're pursuing it. You're still leading your business. Mm -hmm. right? You're in there every day and you're doing all the pieces. You're the leader of analytics and technology and the leader of your business development. And like those things are going to make you successful if you can embrace it. And like you say, learn and adapt to the changes and really lean in to, to what's going on and looking for ways to, to involve others and, and to solve the problems. So as we're winding down here, there's a question I always ask um, all of our guests is, do you you have a favorite book you know, that's had a big impact on you or something you like a gift? Uh, it could be a book, piece of media, audio book, um, anything. Um, it, does it need to be about like data and analytics? No, it could be about general? anything. <laughs> it be about anything. <laughs> uh, I, I, before I answer that question, I will say that if, if, you're, uh, if you're a leader and you want to get more into analytics, find the analysts in your organization and take them to lunch. Um, you get to know them <laughs> because being an analyst or a data scientist is often – you know, somebody else is presenting your data to leaders and it's a like good, if you really want to know what's going on and get data literate fast, like that's a great way to do it. Um, for me, for a book, I'll tell you the, one of the most impactful books I've read and listened to lately is a book called Can't Hurt Me by David oh, yeah. Goggins. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've listened to it about 30 times and it has been uh, uh, quite impactful I really like that book a lot. It's made a big difference. I'm a, an endurance athlete, like on the side, kind of do that thing. And so hearing his story and how he applied these different lessons to not only to the athletic side, but there've been lots of things in there that I've been able to apply to business as well. Um, uh, you know, yeah, lots of different, uh, lots of really good stuff in that book. It's powerful if you're interested in that kind of thing. You know, that's, that's a good one. He, he, he talks about what, uh, having a fracture in both of his legs, basically two broken legs, yeah. um, and, and, and that budge training and going all the way through it. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, just geez. bananas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good book. Um, and another one I'll, I've been really interested in lately is the work that, uh, Andrew Huberman is doing. He's the, he's a neuroscience professor at Stanford and head of the neuroscience lab. Um, so he's on Instagram is at Andrew, uh, at Huberman lab. And he was on a pod on the rich roll podcast episode 533. And it was, it's fantastic. And it gets a lot into learning like how as humans, our brains work to learn and adapt Mm -hmm. new skills, like the idea of neuroplasticity. Um, So, you know, as entrepreneurs, we are in this mode of constantly learning and adapting. And, you know, I'm trying to learn new language right now. And this is fascinating idea of improving our ability to, to learn and adapt, even as we're, you know, 
not a little kid. They have amazing ability to learn new things. And um, he gets a lot into that. So it's, it's really a fascinating stuff. And he actually, in that podcast, he talks about his work with David Goggins when he came into the neuroscience lab at Stanford. Hopefully it wasn't with two fractured legs. It was, it was not. It was way, way past that point. But he, he like, like we talked about with, with leaning in, right, with doing something that is, uh, that is new, um, he, um, he, David Goggins is afraid of sharks and the story. And so they have this AR simulator that is, uh, um, they, they hook up David Goggins. He's like, I want to do it because I'm afraid of sharks. And they, so they make him afraid of sharks. And it's like, lean into the things you're afraid of. Yeah. That was the thing that I, it really resonated with me. And that's uh, kind of like, okay, if there's a challenge out there in business, you, you can do it. Don't be afraid of the failure. Just embrace it and then go for it. That's great. Well, Jason, thank you very much for taking the time with us today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and, and learning more about your own journey and your own challenges and uh, really appreciative of you sharing some of those insights with us and our audience. Yeah, Jason, if people are looking for you or your organization, where, where can they find you? Yeah, we're at marketingscience.co on the web. And then I'm an, at Analytics Pierce on uh, most of the major socials. Perfect. We'll make sure to put that all in our show notes too, so that people can uh, just grab the links. All right. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It's been a, a great discussion. I really appreciate being on the show. All right. No, thanks for coming. Glad to have you.